on C-SPAN 2. University of Wisconsin-Madison professor Jennifer Ratner-Rosenhagen examines antebellum morality through the literature of the time, with a particular focus on Moby Dick. She talks about how authors such as Herman Melville both shaped and were products of 19th century moral codes. Her class is a little over an hour. All right, thank you, students, and welcome to our lecture today, Nature as We Know Her is No Saint, Trial and Tumult in Melville's America. So you all know that I like titles, and I think titles are important because that's an exercise we've done in class, right, to retitle articles that are already out there um, and to put some thought into the titles that we give our papers. And that's because a title announces um, what's at stake or at least hopefully does a good job of announcing at what's at stake, hopefully is a little colorful, hopefully draws you in. Uh, and I hope that Nature as We Know Her Is No Saint is that kind of title. You may think, because the lecture is about Melville and his moral world at mid-19th century America, that it is a Melville quote, but it is in fact a Ralph Waldo Emerson quote. So a contemporary of Melville, um, someone who was in his intellectual orbit, um, and someone who was addressing many of the same kinds of questions and concerns that Melville was. So Nature as We Know It is drawn from Ralph Waldo Emerson's essay of 1844 called Experience. And in it, uh, what Emerson is trying to do in Experience is to say, what would our lives be like? What would, how would we make sense of ourselves how would we make sense of our moral world if we came into an original relation with the universe? That is to say, we didn't have our inherited religion telling us how to make sense of ourselves and our world. We didn't have Europe saying to the new world, here's how to make sense of yourselves and your moral world. What would it look like if we took our experience as in fact the indication of what right and wrong is, what good and evil is, what beautiful and what ugly is. Why can't experience be the fund of our meaning making? And then he goes on to show us why that's so hard to do. Yeah, experience is a thorny thing. It's contingent, it's changing, it's mercurial. So he, he wrestles with this in the piece. But what I love about this piece is not only this title, which I'll, or this, this phrase, which I'll go on to explain in a little bit, but the way that he opens up the essay. So if Call Me Ishmael is one of the great opening lines of a modern novel, Emerson gives us the one, the great opening line of a modern essay. And he says, he opens the essay by asking, where do we find ourselves? Where do we find ourselves? It's this very arresting. And in it, you hear Emerson trying to steady himself and to take stock. Where is he in 1844? Where is he, um, morally speaking? And the rest of the essay is him trying to aright himself. I love that question, where do we find ourselves for us in a much more sort of simple way? Because I think it's a nice way of just taking stock of where do we find ourselves in this class. Uh, we find ourselves in the educational science building, <laughs> not the educational building uh, where we started out. Uh, we find ourselves in Wisconsin. We find ourselves October 5th. And we find ourselves in week six of our course, The Seven Deadly Sins in American History. you know what we're doing. We are using the seven deadly sins as a way of understanding American history from the early period, the earliest contact, up into our own day. What are the seven deadly sins? We struggled with this a little bit on the first day. Oh, for crying out loud. Wrath, envy, gluttony. Oh, so, uh, wrath, envy, gluttony, lust, lust pride, 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 sloth. sloth. Greed. Okay. <laughs> um, there is no sin without context, observes historian Aviad Kleinberg in his, eight, nine, oh, sorry, his 2010 study of the seven deadly sins. And you all know I have another way that I like to put this. There is no sin without history. Or it doesn't make sense to talk about sin without thinking about the historical moment um, in which it's articulated, in which it's expressed, in which it's punished. Yeah? 
that's another way of putting it is that sins have a history, and that's what we're trying to figure out. What kind of history does pride, does greed, does gluttony, does lust, does wrath, does sloth have in American life? How are the seven deadly sins windows for opening up something about a particular period in American life? Um, as you know, we start with the colonial period, and we go up to our own day, and we're seeing how these different sins get made and remade in American intellectual and cultural life. One of the things I think we've already seen, even in the early weeks of our course, is that ideas about sin have a racial component to it, yeah, what, or an ethnic component, what's considered a sin for one race or one ethnicity or one religion or fill it in, you know, fill in the blank, is not necessarily considered a sin for another. We've seen how notions of sin are gendered. Yeah, even the language that are used to describe certain types of sin, we discussed this last week with lust and colonial America, how it has, it gets gendered either as male or female. Um, and we have not yet done this because we're only in week six, but one of the things that we're going to do is we're going to look at how inversions. So how something is once considered to be a sin, how that goes on and gets remade to be a cultural virtue. And a great example that we're going to see is gluttony. An absolute no-no in Puritan, Puritan America and an absolute must um, with, at the fin de siècle, um, turn of the last century with the rise of modern consumer culture. So we're learning not only that sin uh, or that good and evil has a history, but we're also paying a lot of attention to how, as historians, and that's all of us in our class now, how we use sources to try to access those moral worlds, yeah? and to try to listen in to what diff the motivations are of different historical actors. So for the last couple of weeks, we explored lust in colonial America. Now we're moving forward in time and place, and we're in the early republic. So the period that we're looking at for the next couple of weeks is early republic up to the eve of the Civil War. We can call that antebellum America. And the sin we are now exploring is wrath. wrath. We are exploring wrath. And we are using one particular primary source, because if I added another one or another one or another one, you would kill me. So just one, but it's a big one. What source are we using to listen in on concepts of wrath in the antebellum period? Moby Dick. Moby Dick. Yes, Moby Dick. Wonderful. Why Moby Dick? I have to say, this is where I can confess, I told a colleague of mine who teaches, actually is a, a, a former professor at Harvard, uh, who's a Melville uh, uh, and American Renaissance expert, and I told him that I was teaching, um, that I was te sorry, that I was teaching the Seven Deadly Sins class, and that I was teaching Moby Dick, and he said, wonderful, pride. <laughs> and I was like, um, uh, <laughs> so, so uh, let's just put it this way. I think there's some pride going on here, yeah? Uh, some dangerous pride, some reckless pride. So I don't want to make, you know, we don't want it, uh, to Moby Dick to have to be monovocal. There are other sins or other things going on here, too, like lust is here. Um, is it envy? I don't know. We have to think about it. So I don't want to insist that that's the only thing we're going to hear in it. Um, but, uh, so, but, but for now, I'm making it do the heavy lifting on wrath. <laughs> And I think I'm at least good company for making that choice because Jean-Paul Sartre, who was an existential French existential philosopher uh, from the 20th century, uh, thought about Moby Dick and referred to it as an imposing monument. And why did he think it was such a monument? Um, let me have, can I have someone read it? Um, Stacy, do you mind? And I think you're going to... This novel of hatred swells and then bursts beneath the thrust of a cancer. With it, even the novelistic form of the narrative disappears. There is an idea of hatred just as there is an idea of whiteness or of the whale hunt. And this idea involves the whole man, the whole human condition. This is a novel of hatred. It is many other things. It is not only that, but it is also that. Um, and so what I... Why I chose Moby Dick, well, I, I admitted to you all, is I really just wanted to make sure that you read, <laughs> read Moby Dick. Um, it, uh, it'll be a book that you'll take with you in your moral imagination for the rest of your lives, I promise you, and if not, you can come back and 
we can talk about it. Uh, so at the very least, I wanted to make sure that you had read it, but also because I think that Sartre's right, right, Sartre is right, and that there is hatred, um, there is anger, there is what we're calling wrath, just seething um, in this, um, in particular characters, in particular scenes, um, in particular moments, and that's why I think it's just a terrific sis, a, a source to listen in for the sin of wrath. So let's go back to Emerson. Um, have any of you ever read any Emerson? Hand up, Gwyneth. Uh, Kyle, uh, not Nick, a little bit? Is it a name, Stacy? is it a name that's familiar to you all? Yeah, yeah, but he's not really read as much. I'm curious, have you all read Thoreau in high school? Is Thoreau, Thoreau um, has, uh, tends to be read more, I think, nowadays among um, the younger folk than Emerson. Okay, well, if you know Emerson, or at least know of him, you probably think of him as an odd person to be coming in and, yes, okay, Gwyneth is smiling, to come in and talk to us about wrath. Because Emerson's reputation is of just a sweetie pie. He's a cheery, positive thinker. He's a sort of a motivational, an early example of a motivational speaker with a sort of Nike and attitude, just go for it, yeah? This is the Emerson that we all get, if we get it at all, the sort of saccharine or hallmarky Emerson, not the Emerson who cuts like a knife. And I want to introduce you to the, uh, introduce you to the Emer Emerson who cuts um, or at least starts to topple um, our equilib equilibrium. And he's doing it in that very essay, Experience, that, um, that, uh, from which we draw the title of the class. So why pick Emerson here to help us listen in for wrath at this moment? Well, one is I think he's in conversation with Melville. Like I said, they're, they're, they're contemporaries. They're, they're seeing the same moral worlds. They're seeing the same moral problems of their mid-19th century America. They are in conversation. But also, if for no other reason than to remind us what we already know, because we've talked about it and we'll talk about it again, which is no one text is a representative text, right? No single, so we saw that last week with our um, looking at different sources. Any source you're going to pick as a historical source is blinkered is blinded, is limited in some way. So just as we can't, we can't ask, even though Melville wrote this huge monument, imposing monument, he's not a representative thinker. He's not speaking for the whole of America. He's speaking for himself. But he's a particularly perceptive observer, and he's a particularly articulate um, commentator, and that's why we read him. But the only way to really make sense of Melville is to start putting him in the dialogue with um, other folks, other thinkers um, from his day. And one of those is Emerson. So right now I want Emerson to do a little work for us to open up what's the issue here or some of the issues that we see Melville is wrestling with in Moby Dick. Um, I'm going to read this at the risk of seeming to... Um, uh, but that is, I think, the intensity of this 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 quote. He writes... Nature as we know her is no saint. The lights of the church, the ascetics, the gentus and Gramites, she does not distinguish by any favor. She comes eating and drinking and sinning. Her darlings, the great, the strong, the beautiful, are not children of our law, do not come out of the Sunday school, nor weigh their food, nor punctually keep the commandments. Does anyone want to try to take that on? And again, I, it's t tough subjecting a singular quotation to exegesis. It comes out of a much longer piece. But as one writer put it, Emerson works with lightning strikes. That is, even at the level of the singular phrase or the singular quotation, yeah, he's telling us something. Nature as we know her is no saint. So let's go on. The lights of the church, the ascetics, the gentus, which is another word for Hindus uh, from his time, the Grahamites, which is uh, for Sylvester Graham, who was a reformer. She does not distinguish by any favor. Gwyneth. He's basically saying that uh, nature has no moral code. There's, and there wouldn't be something to give a moral code since there's no 
nature, we don't really view as people necessarily. Okay, nice. Kyle, you had your hand up too? Yeah, it's basically saying like that nature doesn't play fair, that it's like it doesn't it doesn't have like a sense of what's right and what's wrong, and that'll just it'll just take. Like when it says um it won't weigh their food. Like uh-huh. it won't just like I guess like it will just, just come and destroy. Yeah. So in that line in particular, I also thought you were going to say, but this is what I hear him saying, is nature also doesn't have any favorites. Yeah? Forget the Christians. Forget the, the ascetics. Forget the Gentus. None of them have a lock on reading nature, on knowing nature, on knowing the truth. She doesn't have any favorites. She doesn't distinguish. So here's a kind of, I think, a pl- very pluralistic move a very radical move by saying no religion has a lock on the whole. Yeah, remember, in experience, he wants a first-hand relationship, a original relation to the universe. So he says, guess what? I'm not going to think that the church or asceticism or the, um, uh, the Gramite reformers, any one of them, are going to give me, yeah, help me to understand nature better. I want that original relationship. I don't want that partial relationship, that perspectival relationship. And the nature is no saint. She comes eating and drinking and sinning. Her, ch- her darlings, the great, the strong, be- the beautiful, are not children of our law. What does that mean? Are not children of our law. Do not come out of the Sunday school. Do not weigh their food or punctually keep the commandments. Who, so... I don't know. I kind of see that. Like, it, it just doesn't account for that. That's not even in its scope. This is something that like Sunday school and commandments and weighing your food or not weighing your food, that's a construct from humans. It's not something that like animals would think about. And animalistic is kind of nature. Right. Or it's not something that nature thinks about. Yeah, yeah this whatever this thing called nature is. Um, thinks much about either. It doesn't respect our little tidy codes of ethic. Doesn't respect our sense of propriety doesn't respect our sense of right and wrong. Yeah? So if we want to come into a right relationship to the universe, how about just coming into a right relationship with the universe and forgetting, or at least criticizing, these different religions that think they have a lock on truth and these codes of moral ethics and propriety, and by that I mean sin, yeah, that we think is going to help us make our way in the world but actually doesn't put us into that original relationship. But that original relationship in Emerson, and I think we see in Melville, is not always a happy one, right? Because nature is no saint. But here I can just hear uh, Herman Melville getting upset. He wants to talk for himself. He doesn't need Emerson and yet we hear him saying something, if not, I mean, not, it's not the exact same thing, but it is in conversation with Emerson. So this is an excerpt from a, a letter that he writes to his dear friend Nathaniel Hawthorne, a name you probably also know, a popular, uh, very accomplished author in his, in his, own, in his day. And uh, Herman Melville was very good friends with him. And in the letter of 1851, which is the year that Moby Dick is published, uh, Melville is praising Hawthorne for his literary skill, his genius, his ability to stare, you know, unafraid into the, you know, the darkness of the universe. Um, What he's praising Hawthorne for doing is saying, this is just an inscrutable universe, but you say no. You have the courage to say no. Uh, But in it, so even though he's supposedly praising Hawthorne, what we do, what we hear is him confessing about something in himself. Um... And I'm going to have someone read this. Okay, Gwyneth, you want to do that? Perhaps, after all, there is no secret. We incline to think that God cannot explain his own secrets, and that he would like to, that he would like a little information upon certain points himself. We mortals astonish him as much as he us, but it is this being of the matter, there lies the knot with which we choke ourselves. As soon as you say me, 
a god, a nature. So soon you jump off from your stool and hang from the beam. Yes, that word is the hangman. Take God out of the dictionary and you will have him in the street. Okay. Now I find that last line confusing, so I had to kind of read it and reread it and reread it and read the larger piece. So let's just hold off on that last line, but it's important, so I kept it here. Put it in, can someone put this in, in a fra- in, in terms that are more resonant with the way that we talk in 2015? And again, you can take it line by line. Just take it line by line. So he's talking here about the universe, the world, life. And he says, perhaps there is no secret. And then go on. Someone do a, a do a guess, even if you you think you, ah. there are many of you I know are good at this. Kyle, um, I'm not a hundred percent sure. But of course I, not, because yeah. I this is me. It's yeah. like guess what he's thinking. Um, it kind of sounds like by us believing in God, we're kind of holding ourselves from the truth by like thinking that there is this other being. Or, or like leave believing in something that we already know is false. Mm-hmm. Like, like he's saying like there is no secret. Like it's just by um, like God cannot explain his own secrets because like there is none. Like there's nothing that he has that we don't. Like, yeah. I mean, think think about that. Perfect. Think about the odd inversion that happens in that second line. He says, "We incline to think that God cannot explain His own secrets, and that He would like a little information upon um, certain points Himself." Wait, what? God, the omniscient, needs a little bit of help on a few points Himself. So already in that line, we have it. Wait a second. This notion of an omniscient, all-knowing God. We mortals astonish him as much as he us. So it's not saying there is no God, God is dead. No, it's just saying if there is a God, there, we're, we're the sort of, we're, we're mutual, there, there's a sort of, we're mystified in both directions, yeah? But that gets away from an, a view of a God as sort of, as, as omniscient, yeah, and all-knowing. But then he goes on, but it is this being of the matter, there lies the knot with which we choke ourselves, as soon as you say, me, a God, a nature, so soon you jump off from your stool and hang from the beam. So what? What? As soon as you use the word God or nature or even me as in a self, you, you, you kill yourself, you choke yourself, you die. What? What? Jen. Once you're so sure of such a universal idea or you're you're just like putting something so far above you and you're so sure of it, that's when you're just like you kill yourself. You kick the stool out from under you and you hang and you choke and you die. And you don't get any closer to the secret, you don't get any closer to this question of being, which is for him the heart of the matter. Yeah? He says, Yes, that word is a hangman. Hold on a sec. That word is a hangman. Take God out of the dictionary and you would have him in the street. I'm not going to subject that last line to exegesis. All I want to say about that last line is just keep it in mind as you read Moby Dick. Think about the people who populate that boat. Is he, I, know, I, I mean, I don't want to insist on this because there's a zillion interpretations and I'm going to show you that they, they come in many, many varieties. But what if you think about that line Take God out of the dictionary. Take those words that we think are so absolute and so all-encompassing and just get rid of it and think about God as the man in the street. Yeah? I think that's a helpful way to try to at least listen into who are these characters that populate the Pequod and what is it he's trying to tell us about him, about them. Yeah? Um, uh, I, it would be dishonest for me to fid- fidget with this quote, but if I could have, I would have snuck in another word here, and it would have been sin. <laughs> because I think that's true for Melville. So it would have been um, historically inaccurate, and yet I think also true that he would say the same thing about the word sin. That sin is a hangman's word, and it doesn't get us any closer to being 
um, uh, or as Emerson says, that original relationship to the universe. Okay, next week we're going to bear down in the text. Uh, we're going to uh, uh, really work with this as a primary source uh, for listening into turn. Uh, to, sorry, for listening into mid nineteenth century America. We're going to subject whole chapters to interpretation. We'll focus on paragraphs. We'll look at the level of the sentence, even the resonant phrase. We're going to see if we can hear what Melville is trying to tell us across the ex expanse that separates him of 1851, his America of 1851, and our America of 2015, about what he means by God, what he means by this being, or Emerson calls experience, what he thinks about individual sin, or in this case, I would say social sin. I think this is very much a comment, not just on the singular, the sin, sin of the singular figure, Although we get that too, but I think it, there's social sin here um, that he is drawing our attention to. Okay, so next week is about zooming in or bearing down, but for today we're zooming out, um, taking a panoramic view. We want to take a look more broadly, if very quickly, across Melville's America in mid-19th century to try to see what is it he's seeing what is it he's responding to? What moral problems does he think he's confronting in the text? We want to look a little bit at, remember we talked about text and context, the context of Moby Dick and tell us what it tells us about, Moby, uh, about Melville's mind, what it tells us about his view of the world. But remember, his mind and his view of the world are themselves product of his own time and place. Yeah. So he's a commentator, but he's living it too. So he doesn't have any special perch on which, from which he can comment on what's right and wrong in America in mid-19th century. He himself is shaped by those ideas, yeah? Um, so we don't want to just use his mind as a way of looking at America, but look at, um, by looking or listening in and paying attention to his mind as itself an expression of uh, the moral worlds um, in American life at that time. Okay, if Moby Dick is a novel of hatred, let us not forget it is also a novel of longing. Yeah? He doesn't, there's not just hating going on, there's desiring, there's wanting going on. So we want to listen for that too. Right? Every sin has its, has its counterpart. Um, every negative emotion has its positive side. So I want you to listen in and as this book is a confession. Yeah? It's a confession, but the work is also a work of social commentary and criticism. So what issues of his day is Melville either commenting on or at least what issues of his day are pressing in on his moral imagination? I'm going to touch on three, uh, and I'm going to do it in a very quick fashion. I mean, this is um, very speedy, speedy, speedy not getting in deep, but just to sort of alert you to the kinds of things uh, that m might be sources uh, for you to, to be paying attention that they're, they're being commented on in the text. Okay, and then once we do this, so we're going to widen out, look at context, and then come back for the last, let's say, I don't know, 10 minutes and think about sin again and think about this as a, as a primary document that's commenting on notions of or, or giving us access to notions of sin at this period. Okay, so the first context, if you will, of Melville's mid-century America is that he is writing this at a time of intense religious pluralism, fervor, and liberalization. In the 19th century, we see Protestantism um, undergoing staggering growth, growth and diversification uh, with the proliferation of different sects different biblical interpretations, different prophets and movements, all aimed at reforming American society and bringing it closer in line with their interpretation of uh, the Bible and the word of God, or their view of the word of God. So it's a time of in intense religious uh, pluralism and fervor, but it's also, interestingly, a time of intense, what we would call liberalization. It's kind of a klutzy word. I don't like the other word that we tend to use, which, um, uh, secularization, because it just seems to so massively overshoot the mark. Um, it's ridiculous to talk about uh, uh, 19th century America as somehow becoming um, in increasingly secular, if by secular we mean 
not religious. Uh, if we mean by secular, we mean worldly, then it fits. That is to say, people aren't becoming less religious. They're simply trying to bring their notions, their religious ideas more in line with the thoughts of the day, with the currents of the time. And so in that regard, we, I think a better word is liberalization of religion. So that is religious sensibility as it gets pressed through enlightenment ideals of rationality and reason. The Enlightenment doesn't get rid of religion, but it helps to reconstitute some forms of Protestantism, uh, and that is that that goes goes on to be what we call liberal Protestantism. Melville's New England is very much part of this liberalization of Christianity, um, so he's living in it, uh, but I think he is critical of it. I think you can hear that in the text. As a cultural historian Ann Douglas put it in her famous 1977 classic, The Feminization of American Culture, Moby Dick was, quote, an implicit critique of liberal Protestantism. And I think she's right. What we see in Moby Dick is that Melville seems to crave some view of the world that is sublime, not beautiful, that is mysterious, not sensical, a God who is inscrutable and not what we would start to hear in the later 19th century, a religion in which Jesus is your friend. Yeah, I've got a friend in Jesus. Uh, Melville doesn't want his God to be his friend. <laughs> yeah? If there's going to be a God, it is going to be a God worthy of um, awe and admiration and terror. And so we see then Melville pushing back against this liberalizing tendency in Protestantism. As one commentator put it, Melville wasn't religious, but he needed the older, more austere form of Calvinism for his moral imagination. So let's put, he was an aesthetic Calvinist. Does that make sense? So it's like someone who do, who's Catholic but doesn't actually believe in all this stuff, but loves the smells and bells, loves the liturgy. Yeah, There's a whole aesthetics to, to religion. And so you might not believe in the tenets, you might not believe in the worldview, but there may be something about it. Um, the ritual, yeah, the architecture of the church, the smells of the church and the holidays that one craves for his or her moral imagination. And I think that's a good way of talking about Melville. He didn't believe it, but he needed it um, for the stuff of his writing. And yet, on the other hand, we also see in, in Moby Dick an appreciation of religious difference and diversity. So we, we see a sort of longing for returning of a more austere form of Calvinism. And at the same time, he's very much in his day in that he's looking around and he seems at least somewhat open to and appreciative of, of diversity. Um, certainly to the idea that no one group has a lock on moral truths. And so I think we can look at the novel and see that he is wrestling with that, this in the novel. Melville is seen as being very apolitical, or certainly by this point in his career, apolitical. Um, but I think that that doesn't quite pick up on the degrees to which his interest in changes in American political life are right there on the page. His America witnessed enormous political changes. I sort of clunkily say this is the period when we witnessed the democratization of democracy, so to speak, that is efforts to make democracy more inclusive, at least among white males, so um, all white males. We see a growing populist and egalitarian political Im impulses captured by the rise and the presidency of Andrew Jackson, who served as president from 1829 to 1837. Though he comes to power with a very anti-elitist or what would later be called a populist kind of everyman rhetoric, he goes on to be one of the great despots or dictators, a term to come about later in American history. And so Jackson's politics help crystallize nagging doubts at the time and doubts that are still with us today, which is how well, how easy is it to pull off democracy? How easy is it to pull off something like equality? Or to put it more in a more pointed way, a concern of the day was, is, does democracy somehow create a, a, a create a kind of craving for despotism, for craving for the strong leader? 
yet to counteract the leveling floor, its leveling forces. These are the, 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 the crucial questions of the day. Um, what kind of leader does a democracy produce? What kind of leader is appropriate for democracy? And then the question about whether in a horizontal society without, um, without royalty, are, are, is the demos more prone to hero worship? Because p- human beings don't do well you know, with a vertical, uh, sorry, with a, you know, with a flattened moral landscape. We hear these questions echoed in Moby Dick, um, as in the texts of many of the writers in Melville's orbit, like, em- like Emerson, like Thoreau, like the writer um, and thinker Margaret Fuller. Many have argued, and I think persuasively, that um, Melville draws his inspiration for Ahab from Jackson, this figure with an iron will, this monomaniacal determination who will let nothing stop him. Ahab says he'd like to strike the sun if it he would strike the sun if it ever insulted him. I don't know if you got to that part yet. And there's an uh, interesting uh, play with that uh, or, or version of that where an admirer of Andrew Jackson in 1840 doesn't just say you'd strike the sun, but actually likens uh, uh, likens Jackson to the sun. He says, "I have seen a light arise in the west, and so brilliant was it that it diminished and obscured all the lesser lights around it. That brilliant light was Andrew Jackson." Okay, so in addition to widespread political transformations, this is also a period of dramatic economic transformations in antebellum uh, America, and it's the period which historians t- typically call a period of the, the Industrial Revolution or Industrialization or the Market Revolution. So these terms are often used interchangeably. It's a period where we see the intensification of a transformation of American economics from a- agriculture to manufacture and industry, where the family uh, farm or the household was once the center of economic production, but that's now moving increasingly to shops and factories. What's aiding industrialization is technological developments um, that in part helps to explain some of the transformation. And thanks to industrialization and technological developments, we get not only a greater um, distribution of goods, but we also get a greater division of labor among workers, which means less independence and control over the labor process and its rewards. Mo- Moby Dick is very much caught in this moment. It's very much caught up in questions of labor and independence or lack thereof of a mass labor force. You'd think a novel that takes place on the high seas would be one of escape from the drudge, from the messy and painful process of industrialization. Ishmael certainly takes to the seas to get away. But then what does he do? Right in that first chapter, he realizes that a whaling ship may be just another exploitative system where workers, uh, the ship hands, are trapped just on, just as badly, uh, on, on, a, on a system or in a system that is just as unjust and just as economically punishing as the one on land. What does he say? I'm going to go ahead and read it because I can read fast. Uh, what, what of it? If some old, oh, so he, so he's, ma- this is um, Ishmael and he's making the decision whether he's going to go out to sea. And he says, what of it if some old hunks of a sea captain orders me to get a broom and sweep down the decks? What does that indignity amount to? Weighed, I mean, in the scales of the New Testament. Do you think the archangel Gabriel thinks anything less of me because I promptly and respectfully obey that old hunks in that particular instance? Who ain't a slave? Tell me that. Well then, however the old sea captains may order me about, however they may thump and punch me about, I have the satisfaction of knowing that it is all right, that everybody else in one way or another served in much the same way, either in a physical or metaphysical point of view, that is. And so the universal thump is just passed around, and all hands should rub each other's shoulder blades and be content. Who ain't a slave? Right? Right? So I'll just go and get battered and bruised. And that, you know, awful economic system. In 18, the 1840s and 1850s in America, a question like that, who ain't a slave, isn't just a, ah, 
isn't just a tough, soft question. It is the question of its day. Yeah, what is free labor? What constitutes free labor if what we're seeing is the emergence of uh, wage slavery in the North? Now, this is not chattel slavery, but it's not, it's, but it ain't great for many of the workers, right? Who ain't a slave is not just a cast off question. Uh, it is a question that announces a problem that he's going to try to figure out in the book. Yeah? So it's a question of what is free labor and what is slave labor, and is free labor really free? At the same time, the question of slavery and the persistent growth of slavery in his own time. So think about it. In 1790, there were 697,000 slaves in America. Uh, by 60 years or 70 years later, on the eve of the Civil War in 1860, there's almost 4 million. So the whole story of, of the early 19th century is about the northern states trying to keep a check on slavery and not have it uh, move into the north. Uh, but we, we're seeing the persistent growth in, numbers, uh, gr growth in numbers of slaves. So slavery is the defining moral problem of Melville's day. And I think this is such a powerful quote by uh, the late historian, Southern historian Michael O'Brien. I think he puts it for us so powerfully. He says, making an empire, making a republic, making a democracy, making property, all these things would have been hard enough to hold together. But to drive the project forward while holding millions in bondage produced a cultural anxiety of stark proportions. And so we see that anxiety in stark proportions in things like these iron horns. Has anyone ever seen this before? No. Okay. Can someone read what that says here? That gives us an indication of what that artifact was. Leah? Um, it just says a woman with horns and bells on to keep her from running away. Okay. Remember we looked at runaway bride or <laughs> runaway uh, wife? advertisements yeah. last week, and we tried to think what that told us about ideas of lust and love. And uh, Well, those were just a small number of the kind of runaway ads that were typically posted in this time. Much more common was runaway slave advertisements um, for people trying to retrieve their property. Uh, but a good way of making sure that a runaway slave wouldn't run away again was using um, this device, which is called iron horns. I think it has other terms as well. So this is a document, right? That's a kind of artifact that we would look at to listen into the kind of thing that O'Brien is talking to us about, the anxiety of stark proportions. That's a kind of document we listen in as we're trying to understand something like sin in historical context. What culture produces that um, and sees it as a virtue? And we can look at things like slave pens. This is from Alexandria, Virginia, which is just right outside the nation's capital. We can see it in slave advertisements, 1855, right around the time of, the, of Moby Dick, just a few years later. A buck, a couple bucks, a wench for sale. And we see it in Moby Dick. Yeah? I'm going to move ahead to ideas about race. So what other context do we see, or what other ideas do we see Melville addressing in Moby Dick? Or to put it differently, what sort of context do we see pressing, its, pressing themselves down into this text? And that is the vibrant discourse about race and different races. And of course, these, this, this goes hand in hand with discussions about slavery. Um, so people used a certain uh, racial theories to justify why slavery was okay um, or morally sanctioned. They, of course, used the Bible as well, but they used um, I, uh, scientific ideas about race. Melville was appalled by slavery, and yet I think as you read in Moby Dick, you'll see that he's at some times pushing against racial ideas of his days, but in other times it's not so... <laughs> So clear. Um, 
And so that's, that's what I just want to alert you to, the ways in which he's addressing some ideas about race and where you see him pushing against it and where you hear or see him perhaps uh, reinforcing ideas that strike you as either outmoded or offensive or, frankly, just racist. At some times, uh, so this is actually a page out of a very famous book, uh, uh, um, not in Glidden's Type of Mankind, 1854. So this was an example of sort of one of the dominant racial theories at mid-century before we get Darwin's origin of species in 1859. And I mean, I don't want to overstate it. It's not like, you know, we get Darwin, 1859, and the world breaks into, and now we have a very evolved, you know, no, no pun intended, but a very developed concept of evolution. It doesn't happen that quickly, certainly not in America, where there's so much pushback uh, in 1859 and in our own day. But it's just to say that Darwin's dis, um, discovery or uh, recognition of natural selection dramatically changes the way that people think about evolution and takes this conversation in a different direction. Prior to Darwin, Knott and Glidden sort of speak for the dominant ideas of the day, which is very uh, racial hierarchies um, and very racial essentialist views about different races, so very categorical. And we see, and sometimes Melville seeming to um, ape that language, and I think in other times very critical of it. Through Ishmael, we have Melville saying, a man can be honest in any sort of skin. We see his friendship, perhaps what others have identified as his love of Queequeg as a kind of race crossing, or, um, or at least an example that, in fact, he practiced what he preached. Melville himself, before writing Moby Dick, um, actually wrote several uh, very popular novels on uh, 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 ships on the high seas. He himself had been a sailor and had traveled around for three years um, on different ships. And at this time, w many of the sailing ships, like, uh, like, pardon me, like the whaling ship uh, of the Pequod, are very cosmopolitan societies. So they're people from oftentimes all over the world, from all over different backgrounds. And so we can see that maybe Melville picks up that sensibility of a kind of cosmopolitan appreciation of variety and difference. At the very least, I just want to remind you or alert you to the fact of, or, or to pay attention to who are the characters in this novel. And when you start to pay attention to who the characters are in the novel, you realize race and racial difference is something that is interesting to him. I mean, this is not, not just for color, so to speak, of these different characters, but there's there's a lot that he's saying with the use of these different characters. So you've got Queequeg, who's African and Polynesian and has elements of Islam and Christianity. You've got Dagu, the blackest coal African harpooner. You've got Pip, the cabin boy. You've got Tashtego, the noble savage, or the, you know, the Native American, but who um, is respectable and refined. We have the mysterious oriental Fedilla. We have Ishmael. This is a picture from Ishmael of the Hebrew Bible or the New Testament. I don't think that's what Ishmael, uh, Melville's Ishmael looked like. He was definitely older. Does anyone remember who Ishmael was from the Hebrew Bible or what the Christians called the Old Testament or even what Muslims call their Quran? Does anyone know who Ishmael is? Yeah, Nick. Uh, son, of, son of Abraham. Uh-huh. And the son of who was whose mother who who was his mother? Uh, Sarah. Well, good. No, his mother. That was Isaac's mother. So uh, um, Hagar was the the handmaiden, and Sarah couldn't get pregnant, and they wanted a child. So Hagar got pregnant with Ishmael, but then Sarah was able to get pregnant and had Isaac. So, but the first son is Ishmael. But then Sarah gets jealous, and so she makes um, Abraham kick them out of the house. 
um, and then they're banished. And therefore, we get the, separate, the separating of the tribes. And Ishmael and his mother go off um, uh, uh, into the desert. Um, and we have the beginnings of a new religious trajectory. As many, many, many years later, Muhammad would come to identify himself and his followers as in line with Ishmael. So Ishmael is one of the forefathers of um, Islam. So these are all part of the uh, what we call the Abrahamic religions, all the religions that go back to Abraham, Judaism first, then Christianity, then Islam. Yeah, the three great monotheistic religions all have the same origins. They're all genetically linked, as it were, but they have very different paths, right? So I think it's not insignificant that Ishmael is called Ishmael, but I don't need to over, you know, push too hard. But we, we want to, he's obviously alerting us to a different track as well. And last but not least, we can't talk about race without talking about the white whale, the imposing, formidable, inscrutable, all-powerful, or seemingly all-powerful or very powerful white whale. I don't want to insist that the whiteness of the whale means anything. Um, we have 150 plus years of people, you know, thinking that they knew what the whiteness of the whale meant by what what that meant. Perhaps it means nothing. I think it's just worth being alerted to, and that whiteness, just as Orientalness or Muslimness or primitiveness or any of the other nisses that we see going on with a sort of racial and religious um, and ethnic diversity, that, 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 the, that uh, Moby Dick is also a character in a story about, or at least, a, um, um, I'm sorry, a commentary on uh, racial difference. Okay, so we have Melville... Uh, I haven't given you any sort of like, okay, this is what this means, and this is what this means. That's not fun, and it's usually never right. But I want to just kind of get you alert to the kinds of contexts that Melville is working within and the kinds of things that I think we can see him working through in the text, among others. So religion, issues of religion and religious belief, issues about political and economic transformation, so democratization and um, the rise of market capitalism and industrialization, as well as slavery, the institution of slavery, and ideas of race. So this should be an ideal primary source, right? This is like perfect. There's a tricky part with that, and that is that Moby Dick was a commercial flop. It, it was a disaster. Readers were very disappointed because he had written these wonderful um, stories of the high seas and they were expecting some more of that, that, that hijinks and that color. And instead, what they got in the word of Jean-Paul Sartre was an imposing monument. And they didn't want an imposing monument. So when we think of Melville as this great, towering, fabulous you know, novelist of, you know, for the ages, well, he wasn't. Um, this, this brought him to near financial ruin. It brought him to psychic ruin. Um, the rest of uh, his intellectual or his career is a very sad one, um, though he does manage to push out a few more um, uh, uh, books. But this was not the consummation, at least in his own lifetime. Um, and yet, um, Melville, Moby Dick gets picked up many years later, um, actually in the 1920s, and Americans rediscover this book. And it's in the 1940s that one of the great commentators, F.O. Matheson, says he wrote this enduring signature of our age. So Moby Dick, as a primary source, is a little tricky because if sales are any indication, it's not the only indication, right? Um, but if sales are an indication of how much he, um, it spoke to readers of his day, it didn't. So we need to both listen in and, and, and push back from the text 
At the very least, we need to do, we need to be very cautious with this text in the same way that we should be cautious with any primary source. Every primary source is partial. Every primary source is blinkered. Every par- a primary source only gives us a, a pr- one perspective, but can't speak to the whole of experience. So again, to make Moby Dick, as big as it is and as magisterial as it is, do all the heavy lifting for ideas of sin in general or wrath in particular is not fair, um, is not a good idea. But I think it's worth paying attention to or at least being mindful of the fact that at least in his own time and place, this was something out of step uh, with what American readers wanted or at least what they, how they thought about their own thinking and their own issues. Okay, so I just wanted to pick up on this. The Melville gets rediscovered in the 1920s. Um, and it's the, from that, there's a, pretty much a straight line of Melville um, as, you know, the major, one of the major authors of American, of our American past. Is, it goes from uh, the 1920s up until our own day. Uh, so Vernon Parrington uh, is um, an early literary uh, commentator who picks up on Melville and sees him as just a great critic of a media, mediocre democracy, or as he put it, the shoddy democracy of his time made his ri- gorge rise. Rockwell Kent, I'm going to show you some more of the illustrations next week, um, made probably, in my view, the best ever uh, Moby Dick illustrations in the 1930s. And we do well to look at them both as... Um, a comment on Moby Dick, but also a comment on America in the 1930s. So America just right after the crash, America entering the Great Depression. Yeah, he's Kent is reading Moby Dick in a particular way because the demands of his own time. And I think we can see some of that in the art. Okay, um, so I wanted to remind you that there are other things going on in Moby Dick. It's not just wrath. And then again, who's wrath and where do we see the wrath? Um, different critics saw different sins or different subjects. Um, so Newton Arvin, an absolutely magnificent literary critic from mid-century, thought that the story of Melville um, the, the, was a story of lust um, and homoerotic lust. The vital injury symbolized by the loss of Ahab's leg, an injury to the capacity for heterosexual love. But Ahab and Ishmael suffer in this way, but for, but Ahab far more terribly of the two, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I'm gonna, we're gonna pull up these quotes next week because I wanna help them to give us sort of stereo sound of interpretation. But you, um, let's just, let's just say he ends on, he sits before a tub of cooling spermaceti. <laughs> Um, so for Newton Arvin, he thinks what this story is about is lust being choked down by senses of propriety of its day. It, it's a, it's a, in, and he thinks it's a beautiful meditation on lust. F.O. Matheson, who I quoted earlier, thinks um, that it is pride. He says in Moby Dick, Melville apprehended, quote, the tragedy of extreme individualism, the disasters of the selfish will, the agony of a spirit so walled within itself that it seemed cut off from any possibility of salvation. Beyond that, his theme of the white whale was so ambivalent that as he probed into the meaning of good and evil, he found their expected value shifting. His symbols were most comprehensive when they enabled him to elicit what remains primeval in our formalized humanity. So it's the agony of that imperial self, yeah, that titanic, um, aggrandized self, so walled within itself, so walled within its hubris, that it is toxic, yeah, that it is damaging, that that's what this is a study of. It is a study of pride. Um, Sartre thinks the same thing. I won't read the quote, but the quote gives some indication that um, if, if, if Sartre had to throw his lot with one of the, with one of the seven deadly sins, he would have said this uh, is not only a novel of hatred, but he would have also added it is a novel of pride. Yeah? Um, to which C.L.R. James, a wonderful mid-century, mid-20th century Marxist activist, uh, so it's a political thinker, writer, historian, says basically... Forget all that. Let me read you what he says. He says, the intellectuals of our time, and by that he's talking about Sartre, uh, and folks like Matheson, and folks like um, Arvin, 
The intellectuals of our time have placed their disease stamp upon the literature of our age as they have placed their disease stamp upon its psychology. So he's talking more generally about existentialism right now. Some of them are men of very great gifts, but for all of them, human beings are the naked and the dead for whom the an eternity. Life is a journey to the end of the night. We're in the darkness of midday. The neurotic personality of our time escapes from freedom into a wasteland of guilt and hopelessness. So basically saying all of these writers of our day are putting their own interpretation on Melville and thinking, oh, man is diseased. He's walled within his own, you know, a grand eye self. He's sick. He's deranged. He's guilt. This is guilt. This is hopelessness. And then he goes on to say, Melville describes the same world in which they live and Ishmael is sick to the the heart with the modern sickness. Yet how light in the scales is this is the contemporary mountain of self-examination and self-pity against the warmth, the humor, the sanity, the anonymous but unflailing humanity of the renegades and castaways and savages of the Pequod, rooted in the whole historical past of man, doing what they have to do, facing what they have to face. Okay, that was a lot of text to swallow. But do you hear the pivot? All of you, and I will say this, all of you white interpreters are so caught up with the, ah, oh, yeah, the storm and the drong of the self and individualism. Why don't we just look at the humble virtues of all those colored folk? Yeah? Forget the sin, forget the alienation, forget the despair. Look at the beauty and the grandeur of Queequeg, of Dashtego of Tashtego, of Dagu, of Pip, yeah? Look at the humble virtues of those workers on this ship. Um, so he doesn't see it as all sunshine and light, but he sees it actually as an argument for the very Marxist perspective that he himself has, right? So the grandeur and the beauty of labor, of collaboration, of racial diversity, okay? So... I think this is, it's a lot to swallow. Again, I'll bring this back to us next week so we can work with it. But you hear, he's just, hey, folks, woohoo. <laughs> can you cut it out? There's something else going on here. And it's not just all the vice and all the chest thumping and whatever. It's also the humble virtues. But I think that if we're going to talk about 19th century America, if we're going to talk about sin, um, if we're going to talk about Meaning in Melville, we do well to let him get the last word. So uh, here I did sneak in sin, God, sin, and other hangman words. What's Melville doing in this book? What is he commenting on? Um, I think we do well to hear that he does want to tell us something about sin, whether it's individual sin or social sin. I think he does want to tell us something about even the word sin itself, like the word God. And I believe he would say it was, it's a hangman's word too. Yeah, it's a word that punishes, that cuts off, that alienates, that degrades. But what might that, the being of the matter just be? Any questions? I know you all, some of you are probably at very different places in the book. How's it going, by the way? <laughs> thumbs up. I got a thumb up. <gasps> okay. Anyone else? Can I get another thumbs up? Tough going? Have you gotten past the whale, the, the categorization of the whales? Okay. That was the worst. Um, I mean, let me hear a little bit. Just, I, I will obviously talk in much more detail next week, um, and we'll carry on the conversation as we move forward. But are you hearing echoes of anything from the class the classes before. Are you hearing Gwyneth? Yeah, and um, I also, it's really interesting to read it with like the perspective from the psychology class because there's so much stuff about like facial expression and body posture that they describe. So that's just an interesting. Like, so um, so um, Gwyneth rightly reminds me that this is part of a FIG, this class, which is a freshman interest group. So you all are first year students and you're taking this class together with a class called Graphic Virtues, Graphic Vices with Linda Berry. So how would you describe that class? You're learning how to... Have the fluidity of line for comics. Okay. Okay. So writing, how do you, how do you create, how do you communicate information in a graphic form? 
right? And the, the information that she's helping you to think about are things like virtue and vice. And you're also taking this wonderful psychology class with Professor Needenthal called, it's the psychology of emotion, right? And so the idea of your freshman interest group is to bring these th three things together, a history class that looks at sin and emotion, as it were, human motivation from a historical perspective, one that's looking at it from a scientific or, in this case, psychological perspective, and another one that's an artistic perspective. So I'm actually glad that you said that, Gwyneth, because I didn't even think about that as being so obvious as we're reading Melville, right? It's a work of art. Uh, so where? There. We're in conversation with Professor Barry. Yeah? Um, you know, she works at the level of, 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 of illustrations. Melville works with prose. But they're, they're both artists, and they're both trying to, to do something with their art. Um, and then together with Professor Needenthal's class on the psychology of emotion, um, you know, I could have put up many more quotes about Melville as the great psychologist of his day, as an earlier a runner, a, a, a forerunner of Freud, who understood the deeps of conscious. And I mean, and oh boy, oh boy, um, just Google Freud, subconscious, id, and Moby Dick and you will be bombarded, yeah? So in a certain sense, we could listen in to, Moby Dick, to Melville as an early psychologist. That term didn't exist in 1851. The, the, the field doesn't yet exist. But he's trying to understand the inner workings of people's minds and their lo longings and their drives. So I'm glad that you mentioned that. Kyle, was it? No? OK. Anybody else? Just a question, a thought that comes out of the talk um, as that helps either clarify something or maybe get your ears pricked to something in the text? Maggie. Well, I guess, like, so is Melville almost living vicariously through um, the main character of Ishmael in a way? Like, does he have the same feelings as Ishmael a lot of the times with, uh, as, like, with God and stuff? Um, that is a wonderful question. And um, I think... I mean, I'm going to just punt, but I'm going to do so in the most heartfelt and authentic way, which is to say it depends on who, you know, what interpreter you ask. So like, do not mistake Ishmael for Melville. Melville's having a lot of, he's being a ventriloquist and using a lot of his characters to say things he wants to say and articulate things he wants to articulate. And yet the most, I think probably one of the more common readings, if not the most common reading, is to really hear Melville in Ishmael. Um, I don't know the concrete answer to that, but I tend to be um, to to identify Ishmael as my Melville, uh, and I'm not saying that that's accurate or that's right, but that's worth asking. Yeah, who's his spokesperson, or or is it distributed, or is it none of them? Is it none of them? Again, Melville, it, it's not a code to crack Moby Dick. In fact, there's another wonderful quote by Sartre. It was like, oh, if these people would just stop trying to crack the code. You know, it is an imposing monument. Stop trying to do that because there's so much symbolism and, you know, the, what does this mean and that number and the, um, and the coin and the this and the that. So you can read it for all its rich symbolism. You can push past it. That's fine. Um, there's no, there's no code cracking in this course, right? We are source whisperers as we were last week, as we will be moving forward. We're trying to just use this source to listen into what it can possibly tell us about the ways that some Americans, and if not some, then at least Melville as a singular and pretty great American made sense of himself and his moral world.